We're so glad that you're here. Hope you have a happy, happy Easter. Anybody, anybody a runner in the house? Anybody a runner? Got a few runners in the house? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not a runner at all. People tell me all the time, Brandon, you're, you're built just like a runner. I'm like, that, thank you? I, I don't know, is this a compliment or like a backhanded jab? But I, I'm not really much of a runner at all. I, I was a runner in high school. I actually ran 110 meter hurdles on the track team. So I was a sprinter. And so running for me was like 15 seconds and that was plenty. I was done. That was it. It's all I needed. Uh, since then, I'm not much of a runner, but our story today, the story of Easter, in fact, is a story that gets people running. Uh, it's a story that happens in John chapter 20 and it's one of those stories that gets people in motion, that gets people moving and even running in the story of Easter. It's a story that dates all the way back to 30 AD in the city of Jerusalem when the news of Jesus' resurrection reached back to the disciples who were holed up in fear and, and holed up and locked up in doubt of Saturday doubting whether this whole thing about Jesus was actually true, uh, fearing the worst because they'd experienced the worst with Jesus on Good Friday. When news reached back to the disciples, it literally set them in motion and got them moving in that moment at that minute. It's not one of these stories that we kind of stick our hands in our pockets and say, oh, that's, that's a cool story. It's not one of these stories where we gather around the water cooler and say, hey, this would be a cool idea if we like wrap some religion around this and packaged it up for some Christian holiday. No, this is a story that sets us in motion, a story that gets us moving and a story that got some of the most unexpected people running in this first century. In John chapter 20, the story goes that uh, it, on this first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. In this moment, hope seems gone. At this moment, promises seem broken. The future looks rough because at this moment, it is still dark. And can we just address the elephant in the room this morning? I know it's Easter Sunday. I know there's a lot of joy. I know it's springtime. I know this is a, a Sunday where we bring celebration about new life. But if we're being honest, for so many in the room today, it, it could feel hopeless. It could feel like it's still dark in your life, even though it's Easter Sunday. Maybe it's because your marriage is just collapsing around you. And maybe the bills are piling up. Maybe the depression will never seem to lift. The anxiety is always present in your mind and in your heart. Maybe the doubt that creeps in screams louder today than it does any other day. Can I just tell you, our God does some of his greatest work in some of the darkest of times. While it was still dark, the story says that Mary Magdalene saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Oh, sorry, no big deal, right? I mean, it's just that guy came back to life. No, no big deal, right? The stone had been rolled away from the tomb in this moment because Jesus was alive. A lot of times we think about, a lot of times we think about the Easter story as this moment where the stone was rolled away so that Jesus could get out of the tomb. And that's the case, but this morning I wonder if the stone was rolled away, not just for Jesus to get out, but for us to go in and see what God had done, to see that God had worked a miracle, the miracle of all miracles that he had brought Jesus back to life. These first words in this first day of the week and the very first Easter, now Mary Magdalene saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb, so... She ran. This is a story that gets us moving, a story that gets us excited, a story that gets us in this moment running. Notice it says that they didn't just kind of hang around and say, hey, let's get breakfast in our stomachs and let's see if we've got any energy to get out. 
No, it wasn't like, hey, I don't know the, I don't know if this news is true. I don't know if this news is real, but do you want to check it out? Do you want to see? No, this was, this was something that immediately in that moment, right away, instantly, they start running. Mary Magdalene takes off running and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. This is John speaking about himself as he's writing about himself. He wants us to know that there are many disciples, but I'm the one Jesus loved. Like, this is me and my family. I've got a brother, but I'm the one my family actually loves. The one whom Jesus loved and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciples, and they were going toward the tomb. In this very first Easter, uh, we see that this is the very first Jerusalem 1,000 meter race, which is about how far it was from where the disciples had literally battened down the hatches because they were afraid of what would happen to them next, to the place where Jesus was buried. They take off running, and they're not running on a track. They're not running down a road with people breaking headwind. They're running through the streets of Jerusalem, the crowded streets with the twists and the turns around all throughout the alleys and around all of these little carts that they're dodging just to get through to where Jesus was. And John is careful to let us know that in this race, like other races, there, there is a winner. Uh, we had the conversation just yesterday about the Easter egg hunt that we had at our house Mommy, Daddy, is this, a, this isn't a competition, is it? I'm like, everything's a competition. It was here in Scripture as well. John wants us to make sure that there's not just a winner in the marathon, not just a winner in the mile, but in the Jerusalem 1,000-meter sprint, there is a winner. Verse 4, both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter. You know this is written by a guy because none of the women would care who wins or loses but John outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first, in case you forgot, also went in. He saw and he believed. You've got two guys on a full sprint to an empty tomb. But do you know what's amazing about this story? What's amazing is when they got there, Jesus was already alive and the work was already done. They ran as fast as they could, but God had already gotten there and God had already worked there by the time they got there. This back and forth tug of war with John kind of switching on the afterburners. This, this back and forth of maybe John took a shortcut that Simon Peter didn't know about and he came in first. But the big story is it doesn't matter which one of them got there first. When they got there, the angel of the Lord was just sitting on the stone that was rolled away and Jesus is walking around in the garden already conquering sin, death, hell, and the grave. The story of Easter is not a story about how fast you need to run to the tomb. No, the story of Easter is that whenever you get there, God's already gonna be there ahead of you. It doesn't matter what place you come in. It doesn't matter what position you show up in in the race. The early bird may get the worm, but there's one for the second guy and one for the third guy there as well because it doesn't matter when you get there or how fast you get there. Because Jesus has already finished all of the work before you arrive. Today, Easter Sunday, is about the reality that God Almighty himself is the first mover in your story. Aren't you glad we didn't show up to church today and come to Easter Sunday to hear some message about what we all need to do in order to get to God? Our message today is that God is the first mover in your story. Because before you even knew you needed an empty tomb, the stone was rolled away. Before you even thought to yourself, this isn't working, my life is in shambles, I need a savior. Before any of that, God had already done the most remarkable running that has ever been done in history. Jesus tells the story of a runner in Luke chapter 15. It's a story 
that captures some of the most epic three stories ever written or ever told in history. The story of the lost sheep, the story of the lost coin, and the story of the lost son. Now, maybe if you've been to church before, you've heard the story of the prodigal son. Maybe if you have a friend who knows Jesus, they've maybe talked about this story, but it's a story that a son approaches his father and says, Dad, I wish you were dead. In that day, sons were allotted an, an inheritance. They were given an inheritance when their father passed. And this son says, I wish you were dead. I know I've got an inheritance coming at some point. I just want it at this point as if you were already dead. Now, we don't know exactly what went down in the story, but the story goes that he gets his inheritance and bolts for a far off country. We're not sure what happens in this country, uh, but somehow he lived a life that was way too fast. He spent his money way too fast and he went broke. All his friends bailed on him. He lost it all. And this son, this younger son, hit rock bottom. Because at some point in this story, he comes to the realization that what I'm doing here is not working. And so he's at a turning point, a tipping point, where he's got to make a decision. And the decision that he makes is captured in Luke chapter 15, verse 18. When this boy realizes he's got to make a change, he says this, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. He decides in this moment, he's gonna make a change. And so what does he do? He gets up, he repents. Verse 20, he arose and came to his father. He came to his senses, but also made a conscious choice, decision to, to take a direction toward home, to turn from his life and turn toward home his father. And so he repents and goes home. And as he's coming home, he's most likely thinking and even rehearsing what he's going to say. I got to repay my dad. I, I'm, not, I'm not making a penny here. I'm, I am so far down to rock bottom that I'm eating what the pigs are eating in this moment. And the only way that I can see paying back my dad is to get a job as one of my dad's hired servants. Because my dad is a very fair and honest and generous man. His workers get paid a very fair and honest and generous wage. And if I could just get on with them, I will work my way back to being home. But check out what happens. And this son arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran. Uh, don't, don't miss the fact that this story is a story of a father running. He ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and kissed him. I am so stunned by the fact that in this moment of getting back together, a father and a son, in this very moment, the father didn't have any contempt on him. There was no pent up frustration and anger for, I can't believe what you've done. I can't believe where you've been. No, there wasn't contempt at all. Instead, there was only compassion, which tells me and tells you today that when God sees us today, when God looks at you, when God sees you where you're at, wherever you're at in your life, he doesn't have contempt for you. No, God has compassion on you. Now, it doesn't mean that the consequences of life aren't real. It doesn't mean that God's happy about the choices that you've made. It just means that he sees how miserable you are. He sees just how much it hurts and how devastating the consequences have been. And he's looking at you going, man, I have so much compassion for you in your situation right now. So much so that it's going to prompt me to start running toward you. Jesus, as he's telling this this trio of three stories. He opens with the story of the lost sheep. There's one sheep out of a, a whole herd of a hundred sheep who gets stuck in a briar. And out of this 100 sheep, the odds aren't terrible. It's just one out of a hundred. But we know God is our, our good shepherd. 
And so he moves to find the one sheep. In the second story, there's a lady who had 10 coins and she lost one coin in her house. And so the odds have moved from one out of 100 to now one out of 10. But we know that God Almighty cares so much that he searches the house until he finds what's lost. Now we've got a father with two sons. So the stakes are moving up and it's no longer one out of 100. It's no longer one out of 10. Now it's one out of two. And this father in the story represents our heavenly father, God, almighty God, who created the heavens and the earth is now running, which has to be the craziest, most absurd thing Jesus could have ever said. Because when you look at this story through the eyes and the lens of a first century Middle Eastern Palestinian world in the time of Jesus, no patriarch in the position of this father would ever have run in public. You're like, we do, we do that all the time. What's the big deal? Why, why can't we run in public in a first century world? No, to run in public would mean that he would have to pull up his robe and tuck it into his belt. And to do that, he would have to expose his legs, which was disrespectful in this culture. It would never happen. It would disgrace the father. It would embarrass the entire village. But the, the father says, I couldn't care less what the village thinks. They're gonna see my ankles. The village is gonna see my shins. They're gonna catch a glimpse of my knees. They're not even gonna get a little bit of thigh this morning because I don't care what the village thinks. I only care that my boy knows what, he, what I think about him. This is the greatest running event in the history of humanity. But don't think about this as the father's sitting on his front porch. He's got a glass of sweet tea, and he's sitting in his rocking chair that he got from Cracker Barrel. But he's looking down the road, and there's a gate at the end of his driveway. No, that would be a very Western way of looking at this story. Because in Jesus' culture, in this day, there's a village involved. In the days of Jesus, people lived in community. And so there's a community reputation at stake. There's something at play here called kazaza. Jesus doesn't explicitly mention kazaza in the story, but it would have been in the back of everyone's mind who was hearing Jesus teach this story. Because in the Jewish law, dating all the way back to the days of Moses, there was a ceremony called the kazaza ceremony. This ceremony would happen if a Jewish boy married someone that the family didn't approve of or if a Jewish boy lost all of their inheritance and embarrassed their entire family. And if the boy decided at any point he wanted to return to the village, then he would have to face the kazaza ceremony. This is a ceremony that happened in the most public way possible at the village gates of the city. And it would be led by the elders of the village. And the father of the boy wasn't even allowed to come to the kazaza ceremony because in this culture, a father's blessings trumped a community's decision. And so the father was required to remain in the house. The mother could come and the mother could advocate and plead for the mercy of her son, but not the dad. The elders of the city would hear this boy's story and decide his fate. And if they decided that Kazaza was coming, this word Kazaza is the Hebrew word for cut off. If they decided that Kazaza was coming, then they would throw this clay pot at the feet of the sun. They would smash it on the ground and say to him, you are now Kazaza. You are cut off from our community and from our village forever. And so this son knew that not only did he have to face his father, he had to face the village with this kazaza ceremony. Can't you imagine him thinking, I know that I'm never gonna get back into the house, but I'll work as hard as I can to pay back the debt just so that I can get back into my hometown. It could have been that the story of this son's return started making its way up the grapevine back to the father. And maybe somehow he heard that his son was coming home. We don't know how long the journey took. We just know he was in a far off country. Did it take a couple of weeks? I don't know. Did it take a week, maybe eight days? We're, we're not sure. But the dad was watching 
the road. Why? Because the dad had to get to his boy before the boy got to the village. So he ran. When he saw him a long way off, he tucked up his robe and started to sprint. I don't care what anybody thinks about me today. I just want my boy to know what I think about him today. And he finds him down the road and throws his arms around his son and kisses his son and shouts out and proclaims, this is my son who was once dead and now is alive. Put the best robe on his back. Get the family ring and put it on his finger. Put shoes on his feet. My son who was lost is now found. On the road, in that moment, reconciliation happened. And reconciliation trumped Kazaza. So that when they returned together, when they came through the gates of their hometown, the boy already had the robe of his father's family. He already had the ring of his father's authority and approval on his finger. He had the shoes that elevated him in the culture of that day and his dad's arm around him that moment. And they just walked right through the city gates, right past Kazaza, right into the house where they had a party for the boy that night. That boy did not get Kazaza. He got grace. And this love, this grace, is something that's available to you in this moment today. You're like, how? This whole Jesus thing, this whole grace thing seems a little bit too easy because maybe for you in your life, in your family, you've just experienced Kazaza. You've experienced someone smashing this clay pot of embarrassment and humiliation. How could you do that? What are you thinking coming back after you've acted like you did? Maybe for you, you've even expected coming into the room today, yes, I'm showing up for an Easter service, but maybe you've thought, if I show up to a church, I'm gonna have to air all of my dirty laundry. I'm gonna have to pull out all of my junk. I'm gonna have to reveal all of the hot garbage that is my life today. This is not what we get. When we get Jesus, we get grace. Now, this is not God saying that there are no consequences, but it is God announcing that there is something new called grace. And when you fast forward from the story that Jesus tells of the prodigal son, if you fast forward to Good Friday, what we begin to see and now understand is that when Jesus hung on the cross, he got kazaza. He literally got cut off to the point that as he's hanging on the cross, he literally says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God Almighty smashed the pot of our sins at the feet of the cross of his son and said, you're cut off so that all of us in this place could be brought in and welcomed in and brought home with our heavenly father. Jesus got Kazaza. We got grace. And that father said, somebody go and kill the fattened calf. Which to a room of people in Orange County who likely the majority of us, of us, if not all of us, are not farmers. We buy our meat at Ralph's or Pavilions or if you wanna go like organic grass fed, you go to Trader Joe's. Like we may not have categories for like why are they killing the fattened calf, but they would in preparation and anticipation for a party, a celebration, would begin preemptively fattening up the calf. Hey, we're gonna have a party in the next six months. Somebody feed this cow so that we've got a big old fattened calf. Go feed this cow more and more and more so that by the time my son comes home, we are ready. Nobody's scrambling around asking if we've got any charcuterie boards. Nobody's walking around wondering if we've got enough in the pantry because we've already got the fattened calf. We're ready for a celebration in this moment. God is the first mover in your story. On the day that you decide you wanna come home, on the day that you decide you need forgiveness, on the day that you recognize you need a savior, you're not gonna catch God off of guard. You're not gonna surprise God and say, oh my goodness, I was so not ready for this. Gosh, do we have anything for a party to celebrate my child coming home? He's, gonna, he's, not, gonna, he's not gonna be put off. God is already anticipating your return. 
His father, when he saw the boy returning, had to have said, I knew my boy was coming back. I expected my boy would come home. I've been praying that he would see the lights, and I've been fattening up a calf this whole time. Today, friends, you can be written into the story, the story of Jesus, a story that doesn't end in guilt and shame and disgust. It doesn't end in you being written off or cut off or shunned. No, this is a story that you're accepted just as you are, right where you are. And if there's anybody in this house today that says, you know, I'm finished doing it on my own. I'm done trying to figure out life on my own and you're ready to say yes to Jesus who, oh, by the way, let me remind you, doesn't have contempt for you but has great compassion for you. You're ready to say yes to Jesus even though, yes, you may have wrecked it all. Yes, you may still be in the middle of brokenness. He sees it all and still loves you. Jesus is ready for you today. Maybe you're a follower of Christ. Maybe you've been following Jesus for years, for decades, for such a long time. But if you're being honest, this this moment, this Easter, just feels tired to you. Feels dead, feels dormant all around you. Let the empty tomb be a reminder that we don't find new life in dead places. I can't tell you how many times God asks me, why, Brandon, why do you look for living water in dry riverbeds? Why do I continue to dig up the old when Jesus has invited me into the new? Why do I settle to live in the pain and hurt of yesterday's offenses when Jesus is inviting me into a tomorrow of healing and promise? Easter reminds us that wherever we're at, God does the impossible that God brings dead things to life and God always keeps his promises. Not just for those lives in scripture, but for your life today. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you that you have conquered sin, death, and the grave. Not just as a cool spiritual story, but as as a reality for us wherever we're at. And so today, God, would you give us the courage to say yes to your invitation? Would we trust that you welcome us, that you run after us, that you chase after us with love and compassion? God, would you remind us when we go searching and go looking in every other place but Jesus that we're gonna come up empty? Today we trust you as you welcome us home. In Jesus' name, amen.